from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, Midtown Manhattan rezoning from the fast track to a dead stop. It was a message to the real estate community, uh, you know, that under this new mayor, under this new administration, you know, the terms might be a little bit different. Diving drones. How Downton Abbey almost didn't make the masterpiece lineup. <laughs> yes, I did turn it down. And New Jersey Christmas trees make the White House A-list. These Lord. are great trees. I mean, look at the shape. They're all beautiful. Funding for this program is made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. Welcome to Metro Focus. It was one of Mayor Bloomberg's biggest projects, a fast-track rezoning of the East Midtown area of Manhattan, one of the most densely packed sections of the city with office towers next to churches, Grand Central Terminal surrounded by alleyways, and every type of building in between. But this ambitious project came to a full stop this month when the mayor withdrew the plan before the city council could vote on it. Joining me now from the Wall Street Journal is reporter Laura Cosisto, who's been writing about the issue. Laura, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So, Laura, why did the mayor pull this project before the city council even had a chance to vote on it? Well, basically, what ended up happening was the administration and members of the city council, including Daniel Gorodnik, who represents the area, and the speaker, were negotiating right down to the, the final hours, and they were unable to reach a deal. And so they had made it clear, Gorodnik and Quinn, that they were going to you know, they were going to quash the proposal. And so preempting them, he basically put out an announcement saying, we're just taking it off the table. So what were the biggest issues that the city council didn't like about the deal? One of the big issues that came up was a question about how they were going to price the air rights that were going to be sold to developers. Those air rights would have paid for transit improvements, sure. open space, other sort of infrastructure in the area. And the community groups wanted the air rights priced in a different way, a way that might have generated more revenue for the city. The city had, their, had a different plan, and so they couldn't come to an agreement on that. Another issue that came up was the hotel workers union wanted a special permit in the area, and at the end of the day, they just couldn't get a deal on that as well. Now, Mayor Bloomberg has said that because this deal's not going through, the city's going to lose a billion dollars in revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars in private sector money to fix the infrastructure in the area, and tens of thousands of jobs. Is he right? Well, it's always difficult to test those numbers or know exactly where they came from. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, one of the reasons why I would suggest it's probably not going to be that big of a deal is that the, 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 pl the, the plan had a provision built into it where it wasn't going to take effect for, until five years after they had originally introduced it, which meant that we really had a few years to go before any of this was going to start happening. And the new mayor, Bill de Blasio, has said he's interested in taking up the plan again. So we may see either no delay at all or not much of one. So do you think that uh, a mayor de Blasio is going to have a project in the works by the end of next year? I think one thing that's come up when I've been talking to people is that he may have a tougher time just because this is one of the very few times that a major land use project by a mayor has been killed. And it may sort of empower people a little bit to say, you know, we can we can negotiate a bit harder. We can demand a bit more. So and, you know, he's going to be also a new mayor and, you know, basically having to push through another mayor's proposal. So it will be a very interesting one to watch. I'll say that. And, and what was the message that the city council wanted to convey with this opposition to the project? Or was there a message? I absolutely think there was a message. It was a message to the real estate community, uh, you know, that under this new mayor, under this new administration, you know, the terms might be a little bit different. The real estate community did pretty well under Bloomberg. He pu pushed through a lot of rezonings that had opposition in the community, but, you know, were good at generating real estate development, economic activity. And I think there was sort of a message that, you know, we might, that we, the community, we, the city council, are going to drive a harder bargain in the future. And uh, whatever the next project look like, looks like, how is it going to be different than this project that just went down in flames? I think you're definitely going to see either more funding for transportation and open space or certainly more of that, a more clear plan for how to get that funding up front and get those improvements up front. Um, I think another thing you're going to see is much more community engagement, I think especially on the issue of open space and what the area should look like. But I just think in general you're going to probably see what will this look like a more collaborative process. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Thank you so much.
With all the talk about what isn't working with the Affordable Care Act, we wanted to bring you the story of one upstate New York town's ongoing effort to care for a unique group that is chronically underinsured. Albany Public TV's Innovation Trail reporter, Jenna Flanagan, takes us to the O Positive Festival in Kingston, New York. Columbus Day weekend in the Stockade District of Uptown Kingston is marked by a repetitive symbol in storefronts on banners and flyers all over town. Named for the most commonly shared blood type, the O Positive Festival employs the age-old barter system to exchange music and art for care. The basic philosophy of O Positive that everybody should be well and that we are all, in a sense, artists and that we are all, in a sense, part of the part of wellness. Dr. Art, as he's referred to by clinic volunteer and staff, is a medical director at Columbia Memorial Hospital in Hudson, New York. He organizes O Positive's main attraction, the pop-up wellness clinic at the Kirkland Hotel. In exchange for performing or displaying their work, 95 different providers are on hand to treat artists to a bevy of different services. Musicians, just like athletes, are susceptible to similar types of wear and tear injuries. Repetitive motions from playing or painting can cause muscle damage, and heavy lifting, moving and dragging can damage the spine. Without proper access to health care, Risman says the underinsured often ignore their symptoms or put off getting help until the situation reaches a crisis. In its fourth year, word is getting out about this communal exchange of the art of medicine for the medicine of art. This year, over 200 bands from all over the world applied for 35 spots, and 90 artists applied to do one of the 30 murals. The O Positive Festival isn't just changing lives of those who participate in it or attend, it's also had a significant impact on the city of Kingston. There are fewer and fewer empty storefronts in the city's historic stockade district, and more and more artists are moving up from New York for the cheaper rents on apartments and studio space. Kingston Mayor Shane Gallo says partnering with O Positive is actually a catalyst for economic development. I do know for a fact a number of the restaurants uptown last year from the festival indicated that they did more business and attracted more newcomers in that one weekend than in three months of being opened. The idea of treating medicine as a form of art is starting to take off across the country. This November, San Francisco will hold its own O Positive Festival, and teams from Easton, Pennsylvania and Vermont were visiting to see how they could bring O Positive to their communities. I'm Jenna Flanagan for Metro Focus. Storms that sweep across the ocean, like Hurricane Sandy or the typhoon that hit the Philippines, are among nature's most destructive events. Predicting those storms is difficult because we know so little about the ocean. But now scientists at Rutgers University have found just the thing, underwater drones. The New York Times video reporter Eric Olson takes us along as an ambitious worldwide ocean study gets underway. This morning we're going out with New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to deploy two gliders. These are underwater robots that we use to monitor conditions off the coast of New Jersey. And this deployment will take place about eight miles southeast of the northern tip of Sandy Hook. For Dr. Josh Kohut, an oceanographer with Rutgers University, nothing beats a day on the water. It's a perfect morning for it. It's a little warm, but that that's okay, because we've got calm seas and light winds, so that makes the deployment just a little bit easier. Especially when you are on a mission to deploy state-of-the-art oceanographic technology. We're probably good here, Bruce. While flying drones have become the source of international controversy, a quiet revolution is taking place beneath the waves, where underwater drones, also called gliders, are increasingly being deployed in the advancement of science. Yeah, the robots like this and technology similar to this are changing the way that we're oceanographers. It's giving us new data. We're deploying these robots in very difficult conditions that humans couldn't sample. Uh, for example, we had robots out in Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Irene. We've sent robots to Antarctica uh, to sample those very difficult conditions. And so we're seeing the ocean like we haven't seen it before. At the forefront of this relatively new and rapidly changing area of ocean research is the team of Dr. Scott Glenn at the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University. So this is a Slocum electric glider. These are designed for sustained observations of the ocean. 
we can sustain these things, we can keep them at sea for up to a year at a time. The nice thing about the gliders is there's no people involved. So it's an autonomous system. It's a robot. You can fly them into harsh environments where you're not going to go with ships and where you're certainly not going to operate with ships. Gliders here are being prepared for upcoming missions. They will be controlled, not at sea, but from this room. We are in the room we call the cool room. It's the most advanced ocean observatory on the planet. The data coming in here from gliders around the globe is giving insight screen. into how the planet is changing. It's the global ocean that's transporting heat and climate change is about what's the heat content of that ocean and how is that heat being transported. And so a change in the heat content or a change in how that heat is transported has a big impact. Just tilt it down towards the water. Over the course of weeks, the glider deployed off New Jersey will make numerous dives. Its onboard sensors will acquire data on temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and more. The data will be sent to Rutgers in real time via satellite. And it'll come to the surface and they'll grab the data, verify that everything's working properly, we're getting the engineering and the science data back that we need. Uh, and if all's clear there, then we're free to head in. It's the amount of data that we could collect on one launch of this from north to south is, is talking in data points of the hundreds of thousands. Um, to generate this type of data using personnel would be physically impossible. Um, so, so we're able to get a much better picture of what the ocean looks like off the New Jersey coast. At the heart of the glider's ability to stay at sea so long, it's a propulsion system that does away entirely with propellers, which drain batteries. This is the engine. This is, this is what replaces the propeller. Instead of a propeller going continuously, you have a buoyancy pump, and that buoyancy pump only uses electricity when it pu pulls the water in or pushes the water out. The rest of the time, it just glides on its own, freely descending or freely ascending. A single glider can cost $100,000 or more, depending on the sensors on board. That is still far less than several days at sea on a research ship, which can cost upwards of $50,000 a day. So since 2003, we've lost eight gliders on 325 missions. Dr. Glenn and his team made headlines in December 2009 when they successfully sailed a glider called RU-27 across the Atlantic Ocean from New Jersey to the coast of Spain in 221 days. Next year, Dr. Glenn hopes to send a fleet of 16 of these gliders in a mission around the world. He calls it the Challenger mission. This is the first time a mission of this scale has been attempted. We plan to deploy three or four gliders in each of the five ocean basins. And so as those gliders are flying around those basins, uh, 16 data streams will be coming in three times a day into this control center. It'll be uh, put, projected on the maps, it'll be assimilated into the models and hopefully improve those models as we are flying along. Because we need that to better forecast our climate and its impact on our weather. So the glider is tuned very well uh, for its flight down and so now we'll, uh, we'll let it take its three and a half week journey down to Cape May. This is Eric Olson for the New York Times. Masterpiece. It's been part of PBS programming for more than 40 years. And one of the most recent members of the Masterpiece Club, Downton Abbey, is now the most watched drama in PBS history, with 24 million viewers tuning in last season. So with the fourth season about to begin this winter and Downton already scheduled for a fifth season, who better to tell us the inside story than executive producer Rebecca Eaton, who has written a memoir titled Making Masterpiece. We'll show you that conversation in just a moment. But first, here's a glimpse of what's next on Downton Abbey. My husband is dead. After all he's suffered in the war, he's killed in a stupid car crash. Isn't that enough for me to deal with? Leave me alone. You're letting yourself be defeated, my lady. I'm sorry if it's a lapse to say so, but someone has to. When your only child dies, then you're not a mother anymore. You're not anything, really. She is broken and bruised, and it is our job to wrap her up and keep her safe from the world. No, Robert. It is our job to bring her back to the world. It's St. Valentine's Day. Imagine you remembering that and my forgetting it. <laughs> Who would have thought such a thing? You're willing to become a German citizen? I'd become an Eskimo if it meant I could marry you. 
Who signed your card? I don't know. It's not signed. We both must have secret admirers. Take her to the theatre. And how do we know she'd want to go? She'll want to go. What should I wear? Clothes. But I haven't got anything right. Not for the theatre in York. It's not Covent Garden. What? Granny and I are always saying there's no one more reliable than Mosley. No one. Careful, Mr. Mosley! Oh, you quite well, Mosley. You mustn't be so obvious. Why not? It's working. Don't suppose you care to dance? And then you'd be wrong, because I'd absolutely love to. Perhaps it was an accident, though they do say there's no one so jealous as a lady's maid. You must choose either death or life. And you think I should choose life? And with me now is Rebecca Eaton, executive producer of Masterpiece. Rebecca, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you, you here. Um, by the way, that was a clip of a little show uh, a little you show. do on Masterpiece the and yeah. Downton yeah, Abbey, yeah, somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let me start where you start your book. Your confession that yes, initially you truth. turned down yes, I did. Downton Abbey I did. when it was presented to you. What? I, I did feel the need. I had to tell the truth. Yes, <laughs> I did turn it down. Uh, they called me. They said, we have this really interesting show, an aristocratic family, beautiful country estate, marriageable young girls, money, life, death. And I said, it sounds good, but we're about to do the new upstairs, downstairs. We had a very full plate. Mm, maybe not. And uh, I must be the luckiest woman in show business because <laughs> it went around the circle of other American television executives to co-produce and nobody picked it up. And I woke up and realized... What made you wake up? Maggie Smith. Uh -huh. I heard Maggie Smith had been cast. She's one of my very, very favorite actresses. And Elizabeth McGovern, who plays Cora, mm -hmm. Called and said she had just been at the table read the the read through the whole cast gets together and she said this is this is going to be really special so I picked up the phone and called and said is it still available and but I still didn't know it was going to be the phenomenon it is anybody who reads your book will know that you were born to be the executive producer of Masterpiece Theater but you really didn't want the job at the no, beginning I didn't want the explain job. that. Uh, you know the John Le Carre book, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold? Yeah. I thought I was a producer then. I was making documentaries. I had just worked on a feature film. And I thought to do Masterpiece, to be the executive producer of Masterpiece, was a desk job. It wasn't really making anything. How was it different than what you expected? Well, I thought it would be easy, first of all, <laughs> because these brilliant productions are made in England. Right. They are not produced here in the States. They're made at the BBC, the independent companies. So. I thought my job would be just watching television all day and say, I'll take that one, I won't take that yeah. one, I'll take that one. Which is kind of how it was in the beginning when Masterpiece was born, Masterpiece Theatre, as it was then in 1971. My predecessor would go to London and watch the tapes of these shows till her eyeballs were spinning mm -hmm. freely in her head. And as soon as I took the job, Masterpiece was 15 years old and almost immediately, this is the year after The Jewel in the Crown, things changed drastically. The British started needing partners to really co-produce. So they needed people to take the risk with them, to come in before the shows were made, to come in on the basis of scripts or ideas or just pitches. So I had to start working a little harder that way to, you know, to, you know really, really understand what, a, what it takes. So determining to what would be produced. Yeah, yeah, and what would make it from the page to the stage, right. as the saying goes. Then the other thing that got harder is that mobile who had underwritten Masterpieces in 1971 to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars, wow. withdrew. Wow. Exxon mo bought mobile, and then we lost the funders. So all of a sudden, we had much less money. PBS did support us through those thin times. Uh, we had to take more risks, and the British stopped making as many costume dramas, right. frock dramas. And so the pipeline sort of dried up. Um, and it got kind of tough. Now, in 2008, Masterpiece Theater became Masterpiece. That's, That's just one of the n numerous changes of the makeover. Why yeah. the makeover? Well, the makeover came out of fear because I realized when HBO picked up Helen Mirren as a Queen Elizabeth I in mm -hmm. Elizabeth the Queen, that they were poised to eat our lunch <laughs> in terms of attracting good projects and, and good actors. They have a much deeper pocket than we do on public television. But um, that and the fact that the ratings were dropping, that we were having a tough time finding a sponsor to replace ExxonMobil, uh, I thought 
you know, uh, I'm the captain on whose watch this ship is going down. I've got to do something. If I had known how tricky it is to rebrand an icon, I never would have done it. It's really hard to do, but I didn't know that. Well, let me do as you do in your book, come back to Downton Abbey. What's the secret of that program? What's the secret to it? If I knew <laughs> the secret to it, I would not tell you on <laughs> television. Uh, I think none of us know. We all have our theories. Um, it might have to do with the times that we live in. Times are tough, times are hard. It looked like well, in those times, course, even though they were tough, World War I, you know, the Titanic going down, that these people were enduring, prevailing, and they were in this house, in this beautiful country house. They are a community that supports each other and sees each other through. And I think it's very good-hearted. My particular theory is it's very good-hearted, but let's not forget the frocks and the beautiful young people, the actors, uh, the, who play the younger people, and the, the solid gold senior British stars like Maggie Smith and Penelope Wilton and Hugh Bonneville, Jim Carter, who play the the older people. So you have a favorite character? I do. Tell us one. I, sh I shouldn't. Come on. I'll just tell you, but yeah, I won't me, yeah, tell, yeah. tell them. <laughs> um, my two favorites are, uh, I have to say, Sophie McShira, who plays Daisy. Interesting. And Rob James Collier, who plays Evil Thomas. And who's going to die on the show this season? Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you really want me to lose my job, apparently. Um, okay, I guess you're I, not. I can't possibly comment. So finally, Rebecca, why did you write uh, this book? Was it your swan song? Are you bidding farewell to Masterpiece you know, and to the rest I of us? You know, I thought I was. I had been doing this show for 27 years, and Masterpiece was 42 years old. And they asked me to write a personal memoir, a working woman, you know, at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, raising a family, how do you do that being a woman executive? And they wanted me to write Masterpiece's memoir, and I really didn't want to do it. I wasn't <laughs> comfortable stepping out in front of the curtain, but as I started to write it and interview Kenneth Branagh, Eileen Atkins, Daniel Radcliffe, and remember how much I love these people, how much I love this programming, and how much the show, Masterpiece, has meant to so many families, uh, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I have the best job in television. Yeah. Why, why would I retire? Why would I? So I am, I'm completely back in the saddle as yeah. a result of that. That's good it. news. That's good news. Well, Rebecca, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ralph. Picking out a Christmas tree soon? For the very first time, trees from the Garden State will be the official White House Christmas trees. The Proud Growers are seventh-generation farmers from Warren County, and they will personally deliver the trees to First Lady Michelle Obama the day after Thanksgiving. Andrew Mullock of the Star-Ledger has a story of how the trees from the town of Belvedere made the cut and became this year's national symbols. That's nice. Actually, that's a nice one. That looks very similar to the last one, huh? Yeah. The same color. Today we're in Belvedere, New Jersey at Wyckoff's Christmas Tree Farm. And the Wyckoff family are the national grand champions uh, for the National it's Christmas Tree forward. Association. Yeah. Staff from the White House came out to start picking the trees, start picking their trees that they want to decorate the White House with, and they start at the Grand Champions Farm. These are great trees. I mean, look at the shape. They're all beautiful. Christmas trees for us are a labor of love. We really do put a lot of effort and a lot of time into our Christmas trees. When we were named national grand champion, it was, uh, there, there's no award that's higher for, a, new, for a, a Christmas tree grower in the United States. It's, I can't, I can't describe how good it feels. We love being here in New Jersey. We, they got great trees and it says Christmas and we're just delighted to be here. Yeah. Many of the uh, more seasoned growers uh, said that a farm from New Jersey couldn't compete. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't do it. It was not possible. When, when they finally called in the grand champion from the state of New Jersey, you know, it kind of, all the, it just took all the wind out of me. You know, that's kind of the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. Looks Very good. good. Sounds good. They usually try to try to get, I think, the decorations done as quickly as possible. So as soon after Thanksgiving um, as possible, they'll ask that those trees be delivered and they'll be put up and then 
the frenzy of decorating takes place. <laughs> so they bring their own uh, tools? We, we supply hand saws. Oh my oh, God. Yeah, we supply hand saws. So what about the spiders? <laughs> 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 you take care of those too. You take care of those too. <laughs> I don't know that I'm I walking in front of you and knock the spiders off. Exactly. You can come cut your tree. I'm going to harvest the trees and we're going to, to haul them to DC. Uh, there's a presentation to the First Lady, and my kids are really excited about meeting the First Lady and the daughters. Uh, you know, New Jersey is traditionally known as the Garden State, and we're known for our great tomatoes. But as the president of the New Jersey Christmas Tree Growers Association, I'm thrilled that from this day forward, we're going to be known for growing great Christmas trees as well. I'm Andre Malloch in Belvedere, New Jersey. We wish the Wyckoffs all the best on their journey to Washington. And we wish all of you a happy holiday this Thanksgiving and Hanukkah. We hope that while you're sharing time with your family and friends, you'll share some time with us as well. You can visit us on Facebook or log on to our website at metrofocus.org. That's it for this edition of Metro Focus. We'll be back in December with news, conversations, and in-depth reporting from New York and New Jersey Public Television. I'm Rafael Piramon. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following.